Imagine, if you will, a podcast. A podcast beyond that which is known to man. It exists in both fandom and discovery, in viewing and critiquing. My name is Matt Hurt. This is Anthology. Hello and welcome to Anthology, presented by ObsessiveViewer.com. If this is your first time listening, Anthology is a podcast exploring science fiction anthology storytelling during television's first golden age, beginning with The Twilight Zone. Each podcast, I share my thoughts on an episode of this iconic series as a first-time viewer, as well as share some thought or trivia about the episode. <laughs> I then end each podcast with a bonus review of a movie or show related to the week's episode. You can find more of Anthology at AnthologyPod.com, and if you want to contact me, you can like the Facebook page at Facebook.com slash AnthologyPod, you can tweet me at ObsessiveViewer, or you can send me an email at Matt at ObsessiveViewer.com, or call and leave me a voicemail at 317-762-6099. And if you like what you hear and you want to support the podcast, the easiest way to do that is to head over to iTunes and leave a rating and review. The more ratings and reviews I get, the easier it will be for people to find the show in iTunes' search results. And if you're feeling particularly generous and want to donate with or want to support Anthology with your wallet, uh, there's a donate button on anthologypod.com and a link in the show notes of this episode. The show notes, by the way, can be found at anthologypod.com slash 027. Any donation made uh, using the donate button goes directly toward the fees to keep the podcast running and makes me able to continue on with the podcast. Today on the podcast, I'll be discussing A Passage for Trumpet. It's the 32nd episode of The Twilight Zone's first season, and it aired on May 20th, 1960. And for this week's bonus review, I'll share my thoughts on The Miraculous Serum, which was episode 38 of Tales of Tomorrow's first season, which was directed by A Passage for Trumpets director Don Medford. And The Miraculous Serum is available in its entirety on YouTube. Um, a link to that is also in the show notes of this episode. And as I like to do on each podcast, I'm going to go ahead and start off this review with a reading of the plot description, uh, the complete plot description, courtesy of the Twilight Zone Companion by Mark Sakri. Just so you know, as usual, the plot description and review that follows is going to be completely spoiler heavy. So I'll be spoiling all of A Passage for Trumpet, but if, uh, if you're worried about the bonus review of the Miraculous Serum, I will not spoil any of that. Convinced that he'll never amount to anything, never even have a girlfriend, Joey has taken to the bottle, with the result that he can't get a gig anywhere. Deciding to commit suicide, he throws himself in front of a truck. When he regains consciousness, he finds himself alone on the street at night. Visiting several of his regular haunts, he is unable to locate anybody he knows, and the people who are there can neither see nor hear him. When he notices that he casts no reflection in a mirror, Joey concludes that he must be a ghost. Reflecting back on his life, he realizes that, contrary to what he previously believed, it was actually filled with any number of small joys. Drawn by the sound of a trumpet being played, Joey meets a tall, elegant man in a tuxedo who, surprisingly, can see and hear him, and knows his name. The man tells him that, that it is the other people who are dead, that Joey is in a limbo between life and death, and the choice of which way to go is his. Joey opts for life. As the man departs, Joey asks his name. The answer, Gabriel. Joey finds himself back on the pavement just an instant after being hit by the truck, alive and unharmed. That night, while playing trumpet on a rooftop, he meets Nan, a, n a newcomer to the city, who shyly asks if Joey can show her the sights. Enthusiastically, he accepts the offer. So this episode stars Jack Klugman in his first of four Twilight Zone episodes. Um, the, his next one will be in season three in the episode A Game of Pool. And he and Burgess Meredith uh, starred in more episodes than any other actor in the Twilight Zone. He also played uh, Lieutenant Bonner in Serling's The Yellow Canary, which I just reviewed a few weeks back on the podcast. And he was uh, probably, I don't know if this was best known, but... Uh, some of his more higher profile roles was as a uh, juror five in 12 angry men. And he also starred as Quincy in Quincy M E. 
Um, he also appeared in one episode of the 1995 revival of The Outer Limits. And let's see, he actually passed away on Christmas Eve in 2012 and was the last cast member of 12 Angry Men to die. Let's see, and uh, Frank Wolf plays Baron, the uh, club owner that denies uh, Joey a, a gig for the night. Uh, this was his only episode of The Twilight Zone, and he started out working in Roger Corman movies uh, before eventually becoming a star in Spaghetti Westerns. And his highest profile role was a part as a farmer in Sergio, Sergio Leone's Once Upon a Time in the West. And sadly, he committed suicide in 1971 in Rome, I believe. And rounding out the cast is John Anderson as Gabriel. Uh, this is his first of four Twilight Zone appearances. Next we'll see of him is Season 2's The Odyssey of Flight 33. Uh, he was also in one episode of The Outer Limits in 1963. And he played California Charlie in Psycho. And honestly, I can't place who that character was. Um, yeah, and I didn't, I didn't do my due diligence before this, but he appeared in Psycho. And from what I could tell, from what I could find, he was very proud to be featured in the Twilight Zone and had a very high opinion of Rod Serling. And he also served in the Coast Guard in uh, World War II, and um, he bears a striking resemblance to Abraham Lincoln, and uh, he actually played Abraham Lincoln three times throughout his career. And writer for this episode is Rod Serling. And it's worth mentioning that one of the characters is named Nan, which is obviously a favorite of Serling. Um, director for this episode is uh, Don Medford, making his first of five directorial, um, not appearances, but directing gigs on The Twilight Zone. Next we'll see of him is fairly soon in The Man in the Bottle, which is in season two of The Twilight Zone. And he had a very prolific TV directing career uh, spanning the 1950s to the 1980s. And he directed a ton of Tales of Tomorrow episodes. Um, by my count, he directed 37 of them, uh, which is really pretty impressive. <laughs> um, I don't know if he, he, I don't know if he directed more episodes than anyone else of Tales of Tomorrow, but I mean, 37 is, is pretty hefty. And this is more anecdotal. This is more just a private thing for me. It's not, I don't think it'll really resonate with anyone listening, but his actual, his last directing credit was an episode of True Blue, which was uh, a one season cop TV show that aired in 1989. And I just mention it because I, I was kind of surprised to see, to see that because True Blue is uh, is one of my earliest memories, like in general. And I remember watching it as a kid, which is absurd because I was like maybe three years old at the time. I don't know if maybe it was a rerun or something because I can't. I don't know. I I don't know what. I don't know where I watched it um, or how I watched it because I was three. I didn't think I had any memories of me as three, but I don't know. Anyway, um, it was a TV show that I really liked as a kid, <laughs> and it was actually my first experience with uh, TV cancellation because it was canceled after uh, one season. Uh, but anyway, that's completely anecdotal and, and not pertinent to this podcast. I just thought that it was interesting that um, True Blue popped up at some point. In, in this podcast. I didn't expect it to. So now with the talent rundown, um, rundown, uh, we've come to my feelings as a viewer. And what I knew about this episode before going into it was absolutely nothing. And in my notes, I have, uh, the title makes me think it may be about a musician, which of course is very perceptive, uh, very perceptive. I know. So, I mean, I'm very, uh, pleased with myself there. But as I started the episode, I first of all, Serling's opening narration, where he introduces us to Joey Crown, says that he's a musician with an odd, intense face, and that he he says that his life is a quest for impossible things. And I really like the the narration. It's it's a it's a very colorful narration. Like he says that. Um, uh, uh, the list of possible th uh, impossible things he says is like flowers in concrete 
or like trying to pluck a note of music out of the air and put it under glass to treasure. And I just, I just, I don't know. I, I love the poetry of his words in that opening narration. I think that it really set um, the stage for a really, a really heartfelt and not intense, but a very introspective on the character's part um, episode. I think that it really, the words that he used in the narration really set the stage for that really well. And so we get the opening scene where, um, where Joey is trying to get, you know, into the club to, to play, uh, his trumpet. And he is basically doing this really impassioned plea to the owner of the club, um, asking him to let him play. And I freaking love the passion in Jack Lugman's performance in, in this scene. Um, he just right off the bat, he really sells the connection that the character has with the trumpet and he sells that incredibly well. And it's, it's just, it's really beautiful the way that it's, the way that it's handled. And then before that, we get, we get an introduction to the fact that, you know, he is an alcoholic. He's, he keeps drinking and, and that affects his, um, his, uh, his performance, not performance, but, but his relationship with the, with the club. And then after his, it has, after his impassioned plea to Baron, um, it's completely undercut by the liquor bottle bottle falling out of his trumpet case. And it's even punctuated by the fact that, uh, the bottle falls and breaks. I thought that was a really nice touch. And it's followed by his rationale for drinking. Essentially it's where Baron gives him money and asks him what asks him why he's throwing his life away or why he is succumbing to, um, essentially alcoholism, like letting, his alcoholism dictate his life. And he goes into this beautiful, beautiful monologue where he just explains how just crummy his life is and how, when he has alcohol in him, he can feel it fills an emptiness in him that he uh, can really, you know, appreciate himself and his talent for the trumpet. And I may actually put a clip of it in this in this episode right here because I think that is it is just beautiful and it's a great like moment in the episode and it's great moving forward. And it's also important to note that it's right before that um, Baron is explaining to him like that he does have things in his life or he had things in his life that he um, that he could have been happy with and and he should have been content with his life before it kind of all went to went down the crapper and it's just it's a beautiful scene and and Serling's writing is just unbelievably beautiful in this in this scene and Jack Lugman he just performs it so well and he puts so much heart into it I I love it so here's the clip of Jack Lugman uh performing in uh a passage for trumpet you traded it off with some bad hooch and you got took you got the crummy end of the stick why joey why because i'm sad because i'm nothing and because i'll live and die in a crummy one roomer with dirty walls and cracked pipes and i'll never even have a girl i'll never be anybody because half of me is this horn i can't even talk to people baron because this horn, that's half my language. But when I'm drunk, Baron, oh, when I'm drunk, boy, I don't see the dirty walls or the cracked pipes. I don't know the clock's going, that the hours are going by. Because then I'm Gabriel. Oh, I'm, I'm Gabriel with a golden horn. And when I put it to my lips, it comes out jeweled. Comes out a symphony. Comes out the smell of, of fresh flowers in summer. Comes out beauty. Beauty. When I'm drunk, 
so Joey Crown kind of reminds me just a little bit, uh, slightly in this in this episode of Gart Williams from uh, A Stop at Willoughby, and it, there's so much complexity to Joey's character here because, as I said, he is um, he's his life is empty and it's dictated by his um, connection to alcohol and. Um, there's just such a deep, complex sadness to, to the character. And it's really, it's really great characterization on Serling's part in his writing. What differentiates him from, from Gart is that he's not stressed from life or forced into misery like Gart was. Um, he's not stuck. He isn't, he hasn't been placed into a, um, into a life that he doesn't want. He's already beaten down. And he's already wallowing. Um, Joey Crown is a character that lives in despair and misery that's generated from within him rather than by outside forces like Gart Williams and A Stop at Willoughby. And I think that the two main characters in the two stories kind of complement each other in, in a pretty interesting way. Um, and, and I really and I really latched on to it. And I really like that kind of story in this first season of The Twilight Zone. Um, and then not, that's not to brush off... Or if I, if I can backtrack just a little bit, also, um, when he is giving his giving his monologue and he's talking about um, how he is when he's drunk with with the trumpet, he mentions that he's like Gabriel with a golden horn, and and that's a religious reference that went way over my head because honestly, I'm not a religious person. I didn't grow up uh, with religion, and I don't practice any religion. Um, currently. So that reference, and I mean, that's one of the like minor sticking points I have with the episode is that that's not, I mean, that's kind of, it's not making the assumption that everyone knows what it means, but it kind of is. And it's, um, I don't know. It's just, it just went over my head. Like I had to Google it and it, um, uh, it turns out that, uh, Gabriel was the, the angel that blew the horn on, on judgment day and revelations, I think. um, so yeah, so that that kind of was lost on me a little bit and made me feel a little bit uh not necessarily disconnected from the episode, but it kind of made me feel like I was missing something, which I was. Um yeah, I just wasn't I wasn't educated on that on that uh thing. So then after he is you know, still wallowing, he pl- he plays his trumpet a little bit. He can't really uh, hit the high note on it. So he ends up selling his trumpet and it's really sad that first the, uh, pawn shop owner, he, uh, offers him, he says eight and a half, which I'm assuming is $8 and 50 cents. And I don't know, this is another, just, just again, minor sticking points. Like, like I overall, I really liked this episode. It's just, there are a couple things that didn't quite connect with me that much, but, um, I'm not, I wasn't sure if he was selling it because he needs money because he couldn't, couldn't get, get, uh, get the gig with Baron or if it's because he's just so depressed and he doesn't find joy in the trumpet anymore and that he's bitter and he thinks that, okay, well selling the trumpet for money to get, to get booze will be better than having the trumpet in my life. Um, like that's where his frame of mind is that he thinks that having alcohol in his system will give him more joy than the thing that he attaches is attached to most. And that implication is really, really sad and, and really, really makes you root for the character and, and really hopeful that the character will get out of it. And then after like we show that he sells a trumpet and then he comes stumbling out of the bar, he's drunk. Uh, Jack Lugman does a really, um, a really, f- that's, that's kind of the thing about his whole, performance i almost said he does a really fun drunk performance but that's kind of how his performance is throughout the entire episode he has this kind of playful fun thing to it it's it's doesn't it's really impressive the way that he does it because he he is this fun not fun loving but this he has this joviality to him that it but it doesn't take away from the sadness and, and the emptiness and, and the more dramatic aspects of his character. And that's, that is a, 
juggling act that is unbelievably like well done like it's it's really incredible the way that he can juggle those those two types of uh character traits without being just one or the other and it's something that i have the utmost respect for jack klugman for because that's a really tough thing to do and he does it and he does it in a way that like really great actors can do things in which that it makes him it makes it look so effortless and he just he he really impressed me this this in this episode i thought that he did a phenomenal job and so anyway, so he he goes back to the to the pawn shop um and he kind of leans up against the window and he stares at his trumpet and there's a there's a piece of dialogue between him or really just the the shop owner telling him that he says, "Don't worry, I'm not getting that much that fast." So that juxtaposed with the shop owner first telling him that he uh has been in there before like he meant he mentions that he's been there before i don't know if this is supposed to signify that joey uh has a habit of selling his trumpet for 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 booze money and then buying it back um i thought that that's what they were going for but then that doesn't really make sense that doesn't really track because if he sells his trumpet how does he make money we have no frame of reference for how he makes money and i don't know I think I'm overthinking it. <laughs> um, um, I think I'm really overthinking it uh, because in that case, it made me it made me think that well, if that's the if that's the case, and that he has a habit of doing that, what if jumping in front of a front of a moving vehicle isn't a suicide attempt, but instead a way to get someone to pay out money to get him um, his trumpet back? But I think that's overthinking it, and I don't want that interpretation to be my interpretation of it because I think it cheapens the end of the episode um, quite a bit with the truck driver paying him off and him making the choice to stay alive. And it also contra like there are so much, there's so much stuff in this episode to contradict that reading that I think that I'm really just reaching there and that um, he sells his trumpet because he's sad and he wants to drink. And he, I think that him going into the pawn shop and the, and the shop owner telling him that he's been there, like, or referencing that he's been there several times. I think that's just more he, him trying to, trying to let go of the trumpet or trying to build up, like build up the nerve to actually sell the trumpet. Maybe this is his final straw. This is his, maybe him coming into the pawn shop several times, uh, like repeatedly going in there with the trumpet to try to sell it. Maybe that's him trying to work up the nerve to commit suicide. Maybe that's him finally get, selling the trumpet, letting go of it, and then and then killing himself. And when he actually jumps in, jumps in front of the truck, I, um, I I liked it. I liked. I thought it was a pretty solid uh, effect because it it shows him jump in front of it like it shows the truck coming shows him shows him jumping off the curve and then or curb and then we immediately zoom right into the driver's face with with tire screeching sound effects and then instead of holding on that we immediately cut to a very quick cut and zoom into a screaming woman's face it's i mean it's kind of it not silly but it's kind of uh kind of a dated type of effect, but I think it worked really well in this episode. I thought that it was handled pretty well. I, I liked it. And then we're ushered into the next segment of the, of the episode or the next uh, act essentially where he is, well, there's not technically an act break. Uh, it doesn't cut to commercial there. It just uh, cuts to day to night and uh, has him, has him wake up on the, on the, on the, on the sidewalk. And at this point in my first viewing, I was, kind of i mean i was surprised to see you know the main character get hit by a truck and then i immediately thought is he a ghost now and then i kind of i was on board with that i thought that was really cool um a really cool aspect of it kind of um and it's uh it's a wonderful life kind of thing and i especially like the that it's not it's not a direct like it's a wonderful life type of scenario he isn't being guided through um, his life to show what that his life has meaning. Um, instead, we get this more, this more introspective 
uh, thing where he is, where everyone's ignoring him. And then he's also interacting with people that he's never seen before. Like I, I didn't pick up on that fact the first time I saw it. Like he, um, interacts with people that are in positions that he, uh, would normally meet other people, um, or regular people that he knows. So, um, I'm thinking of, he, uh, talks to the, uh, to the police officer, to the, uh, ticketing, uh, ticket lady and the bartender. And each time he says, Oh, um, ask, ask the other patrolman who's here all the time. I'm, I'm a good guy. I don't mean any harm by it or whatever. And, uh, he mentions, uh, there being a different girl taking the tickets. And then, uh, when he talks to the bartender, he says, Oh yeah, Charlie would give me drinks on the house and stuff. Um, and I, th- I think I didn't pick up on that because we didn't meet any of those characters previous to the accident. And that's not a complaint on the episode by at, at all. Um, we didn't need to see him go. Um, we didn't need to see him go into the bar and talk to Charlie and get the drink and, and reminisce about the record that he played for him as a surprise. Or we didn't need to see him uh, wake up after after a binge and have the have the officer just kind of like okay well like show their relationship and everything we didn't need any of that and frankly i will take jack Klug or uh jack klugman's somber monologue uh to baron about his life and and uh about why he's so sad and empty over those introductory kind of breadcrumb inter- interactions any day like i like that scene with with uh Jack Klugman in his monologue was so so great that we didn't need any of that setup at all like that's m- that's more than enough setup and it also works better because because he actually tells Baron uh while he's while he's pleading with him to to get the gig he says that he can't speak to people like he he his life is so intertwined with the trumpet and his music that he just can't speak to other people because ha- like his language is his is his music, and I think that that works well as a setup for us seeing him literally not being able to talk to anyone, not being able to not being heard, and not having communication with anyone around him. And I, re- I really like that. Um, because it's not over the head, over, um, it's not over the, over the top or it's not beating us over the head with the, with, with it. It's just, it's just there. It's there and it's a very organic and it, it kind of, it breathes well into the story. And I really appreciate that. And then we get a really cool, um, as he's kind of going through, um, his, his limbo, we get this really cool effect where he is talking to the ticket or talking at the ticket agent and he is trying to get her attention and, um, not really working. It's, it's not working at all. And like when he, when he gets frustrated and, and yells, look at me at her, it's, I don't know, something about that delivery. I, I loved it. There's power behind that. He's frustrated and he's, but he's still, he's still a good earnest guy, but he's, there's power behind that frustration and he can tell that there's something wrong. And then we see that he doesn't have a reflection and I really like this effect. And I looked in or, or like I read up on it and it's really awesome the way that they handled it. So he, so he's going through, he's talking to the ticket agent and then he looks over at the mirror and sees the reflection, but sees that he is not reflected in in the mirror and it's all in one take and the way that they did it was that they had a glass a clear glass in place of the mirror built built uh the set to be identical on either side of the glass um only you know reversed because of mirror a mirror image of each side and the actual actress who played the ticket taker um had an identical twin (laughs) So they were both in the scene and Joey looks over at the reflection and sees the twin. And to our eyes, it's a reflection of, of, of the scene. I thought that was, that was just really kind of ingenious. I I really liked that. And then 
there's some instances or there's a couple instances where he's like there's a close up where he's not necessarily a close up but he is close to the glass of the ticket taker and um a couple scenes later when he goes up to the um reflection or goes up to the to the mirror we see his reflection in the clear glass and obviously um 1960s televisions um weren't necessarily the high def um flat screen TVs we have now or anything but but even still I can I can kind of rationalize that in my head like I can that doesn't detract from it cuz I can kind of see in my head I can view it as well he has a very faint reflection in a couple scenes because he isn't dead he's still in limbo he still has that choice that's not at all what they intended to convey in this episode or that's not anything there wasn't anything creatively to say that when they when they created this this episode i'm sure but i just like i rationalize that in my head and i think that it kind of um i think that reading kind of informs the the piece a a little bit too and so he comes to the realization that he under his assumption he's dead and i'm really glad that the episode didn't drag that out or make that a twist at the end because that would have been just really lame because obviously there's something going on uh, right from the outset. And when Joey realizes that he, he kind of, he turns away or doesn't turn away, but he kind of moves away from the ticket counter. And he just says for the first time in the very short life of Joey crown, he was successful at something. And that again, just, um, just really accentuates or really adds as some more uh some more detail to his sadness and and his depression and 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 what he's going through i think that that's uh, it i mean it informed the character more even though it reinforced what we already knew i think that that was a really depressing uh moment and i and it made me really really care for that character like the whole Jack Klugman's performance is so down to earth and earnest and, and just so heartfelt that, I mean, you gotta love that character. And so we get a scene, another important scene after that, where he is at the, he's at, he's at the bar and he's just reflecting on his life. And I really like that scene. And he, cause he says like, can no one see me? No one can see me. Like he's, he knows what's going on. He's, he has an idea and now he's a little bit more morose and he says, none of you of course would have noticed me. And that just goes to his mental projection of, of what his, of what his life is like, that he's an unassuming guy that, that isn't going to amount to anything, hasn't amounted to anything that no one, he says, I'm not the kind of guy you would have noticed. And I think that's just really sad and, and depressing. And it just re, re, reinforces, um, his, his position and the position of the character. And then as he's speaking at the, um, at the, the bartender, we get this really wonderful moment where he slowly starts remembering good things about his life. He starts to positively reflect on his life and he starts telling, he starts speaking about how Charlie, the bartender, um, one time surprised him with the record on the juke, on, on the jukebox with his solo on it. And that's kind of the beginning of Joey realizing that he has a, a life that's worth living for. And he has, there are things that he, that he has in his life that are good. And that kind of brings us to him meeting Gabriel. And it's, it's a really nice, again, I I'm just lauding praise uh, upon Jack Klugman, but just, he is the most likable character, um, in, in this episode. Like he is so likable. He, like, he just point blank asks him, like, are you ghost too? And then, and then, uh, Gabriel does the whole not really, which is like that immediately made me think of a nice place to visit, which I'll talk a little bit more about some of their loose sim- sim- uh, similarities um, here in a bit. But because um, it reminded me of uh, uh, Pip and, and Pip saying that like not answering the question of whether or not he is uh, 
uh, the character's uh, guardian angel or anything in uh, in a nice place to visit. So I, I and immediately signaled to me like, oh, the guy said he's not really a ghost. Like, what is he really? And it, it made me really curious how the how the uh, episode was going to turn out. I mean, this is the thirty second episode, of the Twilight's Twilight Zone's first season, and then we get this um, the reveal as Gabriel says that um, Joey's not dead and in that everyone else is dead. And I like that in the 32nd episode that aired of the twilight zone, I kind of get this. I don't have a frame of reference, obviously, cause I'm only 30, but I don't have a frame of reference for what it's, what the, um, the culture was for TV viewing back in 1960. But I get the sense that, you know, if people are watching week to week, everyone's watching each week the twilight zone and they kind of get after 31 episodes, they kind of get a sense for what's for what's going to happen. Then they have this character who's dead and wakes up in, in, you know, in afterlife they're going and he's saying that he's, that he's a ghost. They're going to think that he's a ghost. And I like that there's a, a nice misdirect in this episode that it kind of, it subverts that expectation on the audience. And, um, and then it's, uh, it's, coupled with a really kind of a little hokey, but it's still kind of, it's more of the time than anything where, um, we get a slow zoom into, uh, Jack Klugman's face that he, as he kind of turns and says, I'm not dead. And again, the earnestness of, of Jack Klugman kind of saves that from being more hokey than it may have come across for me, um, than anything. But then, uh, he's told Joey's told by Gabriel that he's actually in limbo and that he's between between the two worlds. He's between the real and the shadow, and that he has a choice of whether or not he wants to die as he as he planned to with the truck, or attempted to with the truck, or if he wants to you know live his life. And I I have to say I probably the strongest thing about this episode for me is that Joey isn't taught this lesson about his life specifically. Like Baron tells him that there's, there are things in his life that, that he loved before, before uh, everything went to crap. But overall he's coming to this realization himself, like him, him reflecting on, on Charlie with the jukebox and, and the bar and him kind of just, it's very, it's very, it's a very personal story for the character. And he's coming to the realization himself that, and, and it isn't like he's being guided to it by Gabriel or some spiritual entity. He's just living in this zone, no pun intended, um, where he's just, he's just coming to terms with, with who he is and what his life can have, um, if he applies himself and, and if he, if he wants it to. And, I don't know. He's just, he's having a clear thought and a clear view at the better aspects of his life, and it's kind of beautiful. And Jack Klugman's performance is so earnest with it, and almost gleeful as he realizes that his life is worth living. That it's something that I connected to on so many levels and really, really enjoyed. <laughs> and then we get the uh, after after Gabriel has done his job or, or what have you, um, he leaves, and then. We get Joey's super pleasant, like, hey, I didn't catch your name. And then we get the whole, uh, it's Gabe, short for Gabriel, in, in a scene where he is standing underneath a light that, that shows like a halo, which makes me think why I didn't catch any of that the first viewing. But um, but it's it's a nice effect. And uh, yeah, it, it, really, it really brings us to a good moment for the... Uh, Joey Crown character, because then he wakes up and he is back on the back on the ground. He he wakes up. Everyone is, uh, you know, making sure like making sure he's okay and everything. And we kind of reach the end of the end ish of the episode, or the episode starts to wind down. Um, <laughs> I really like the just really quick, um, quick and effective way to, um, kind of close out the story of, of the trumpet by having the driver just pay him to be quiet. It's very quick. It's very like, you don't like it. it, It's organic. Yeah. It's organic, but it's like, obviously that's the money that he'll use for the trumpet. It's not a divine intervention thing or anything. Um, Gabriel doesn't like 
create a situation where he gets the money to get the trumpet so he can be happy. It's just pure happenstance or maybe not happenstance, but it's, it's just, it's a nice touch. It, um, kind of signifies that things will start to turn around for Joey it, to an extent. It's his first good moment after he wakes up. And then we get a scene, the the last scene of the episode where he is, first of all, first of all, when he gets the trumpet back, I, again, I just love Jack Klugman's performance because he does this little, um, like playfully, like giving the shop owner the money. It's just, you can feel how like renewed he is and how, how happy he is suddenly. And I just, I love it. I love it because this is a character that I connected with and you want to see succeed and you want him to be happy. And it's, it's great. And then that leads to a really, a really beautiful final scene where he's on the roof of the building and he is playing his trumpet. And then, um, he meets Nan who has a, they immediately have this connection. And like, all I thought was, this is such a nice episode. (laughs) Um, because, she is their conversation is so cute the, like their meet cute is so nice that it's it's it doesn't feel written it just feels very natural and she's saying that she's new to the city and that and then uh he mentions that he'll play for her and everything and it's just his it's his first human connection in his quote unquote new life and it's it's a beautiful thing and i swear when she asks him to show her the city and he responds with uh with me he just he says me in a v- just i it's so it's so incredibly sweet and it's so like it's it's not that he is su- necessarily surprised i mean he's a little surprised but it's not that he is um it's not a negative space. It doesn't come from a negative space. Like me, like, like he doesn't, he isn't being hard on himself. He's just kind of, it's gleeful the way that he is gleeful and hopeful that he's like me. Really? It's just, it's the sweetest thing. And I, I, I love it. I think that that's a beautiful scene to end this episode on because it's just, it's, it's so beautiful. It, it almost, it almost made me tear up just because this character is so, um, earnest and, and you just fall in love with this character and you want to see him succeed and to see him succeed and, and, uh, hopefully strike up a romance with, with, uh, someone who seems super sweet also is just, it's, it's a beautiful, I, I loved the ending of this episode and, uh, I think that it was really, really strong. And so I don't have much trivia for this episode except for, um, the name of the club. It's, uh, it just says Houghton. Uh, which is a reference to Buck Houghton. Uh, I assume that that was uh, that that was intentional. I couldn't find anything to really corroborate that, but it, I mean, it's got to be. Um, so that's really the only piece of trivia I have. There's some trivia that's woven into my review, but um, that's about all I've got for that. So, in closing, this episode seems to be similar to an extent to a nice place to visit, but from a completely different angle or on a different side of the spectrum uh, for it. And in a nice place to visit, we see a remorseless thug's visit to the other side for his condemnation. And here we have Joey Crown, who's a down on his luck musician, whose trip to the other side actually saves his life and rejuvenates him. They're kind of antithesis, uh, antitheses of each other. I think that's right. Um, anyway, and overall, I thought that it was just a really, a really nice episode, and and I liked it a lot. And the heart that Jack Klugman pours into his performance is a thing of absolute beauty, and I really admire his ability to make me feel so strongly for this character. And it makes me really excited for the the episodes with him in it going forward in in this uh, in this series because he was really really great he carried the episode really well and i love that the character's journey is one of self-reflection but it's subtle and, and, and it's subtle and character driven and it's not something that's beaten over our heads with anything it's it's the strong uh writing is what lets klugman def- 
uh, deliver such a strong and heartfelt performance, and I absolutely loved it. And I think that the the marriage of of Jack Klugman and Rod Serling's work together professionally, not literally, um, professionally, is really uh, really beautiful. And I'm looking forward to seeing um, what what the show has in store for these two, uh, for Jack Klugman, his uh, his uh, performances moving forward in the twilight zone. So that'll do it for the review of a passage for trumpet. And before we move on to this week's bonus review, uh, here's a highlight from episode 178 of the obsessive viewer. It's a weekly movie and TV podcast that I host with my friends, Mike and tiny over at obsessiveviewer.com. And this episode was actually the one that I did solo. So, um, yeah, anyway, here it is. Gil Birmingham spoke really eloquently and beautifully about um, the story of the movie and how it impacted him and how it resonated with him both as both as um, a Native American and as someone who grew up in, in uh, whose whose father was in law enforcement. So and it was really well. Of course, you can find the Obsessive Viewer on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and at obsessiveviewer.com. And you can find the episode you just heard a clip from at obsessiveviewer.com slash OV178. So this week's bonus review is for The Miraculous Serum. It's an episode of Tales of Tomorrow that aired in June of 1952. And I'm just going to read a quick plot description in case uh, you guys want to know if you're interested in checking it out. A physician invents a serum allowing animals to overcome any illness or injury by magnifying their adaptability. He tests it on an impoverished young woman who's moments from death. Becoming healthier than she's ever been, she thanks him for giving her the world, which for her is much more than a figure of speech. This episode was directed by Don uh, Medford, (laughs) and the episode was sponsored by Chrysler watch bands. Um, and just when I check out episodes of tales of tomorrow, um, much like when I did my review of what you need, um, I really like the way that they, uh, they, they do their ad, their advertising essentially, uh, at the upfront and, and at the ad breaks. Um, it's, it's kind of, it's fun. There's the, the host, I think that this was, um, an, a substitute for, for the regular host and it's, uh, uh, Rex Marshall and he introduces himself as Marshall, the magician, and he has like a robe and, and a, and a hat and everything. It's, it's kind of goofy and <laughs> it, it's showing like, okay, well, you know, we can pull a rabbit out of the hat and everything. And it's just, it's clearly like, like he puts the, uh, the, he has the hat in his hand and he puts it out of frame so someone can put the rabbit in the hat and then pull it back into frame. It's, it's really, it's kind of cute. Um, and that leads directly into an ad for Chrysler, uh, watch bands. And I, I don't know. I, I, I thought that was just kind of cute and, uh, nostalgic or not nostalgic, but it was kind of, a uh, a cute little time capsule essentially. So the actual episode, as it goes into it, we see we see two characters just kind of butting heads over the ethics of what of of a discovery that one of them has made. One is the head of the hospital, and the other one's a biochemist. And the biochemist has created the serum that cures patients, and is this? It's the title, the titular miraculous serum. And I like that there is time spent to discuss the uh, the ethical implications of it, and they have this nice back and forth about about whether or not they should they should use it, or whether or not the head of the hospital should allow the biochemist to uh, uh, to test it on a patient, on a human patient. And spoiler, of course, he does, and that's kind of the impetus for the entire episode. And what I found interesting about it is that the serum does cure patients, but they they die first. And I kind of thought that there would be more to that, but there there didn't really there wasn't really that much to it. And of course, this comes uh, a while before the actual uh, um, uh, a while before George Romero created a, a long while before, like almost a decade before um, or over a decade actually uh, before. George Romero uh, kind of created the modern idea of, of zombies uh, with the night of the living dead. So I thought that was interesting that in this episode, the, the patient after they get the serum actually 
medically dies and then and then comes back to life. It's it's played for suspense and it's played for a uh, suspenseful moment. But I, I like the fact that this character dies and then comes back to life as something that is dangerous. And um, I, I thought that, that was kind of cool. And it, there's <laughs> after they test the serum, they do this time lapse effect that is uh, kind of it's it's an easy like it's an easy effect it's it's they just zoom in on a clock and then they zoom in tight enough until it becomes completely unfocused and then they zoom out on a different time um and it comes into focus i thought that was just kind of i don't know i thought that was kind of not cheap but i, I thought it was an it was a it was a really easy effect to do and it was effective i mean i'm, I'm not knocking it for it i just thought that it was kind of cool so after the woman is cured she has some changes to her that um leads to some really interesting conversations and situations um she lacks a kind of moral compass and she can't really tell like she doesn't really have a sense for what's right and wrong and i like the in- implications of of it there's some really great dialogue between the head of the hospital and and the biochemist that i won't spoil here but i i like that section of the episode a lot and i kind of wish that they would have done a little bit more with it like more make her more more of a dangerous entity than than what she ended up being cuz the the, the it's there. It's there in the writing that um, it's set up that she's going to be this dangerous person, but it's, it's kind of tame by comparison. Of course, that maybe that's just restricted by the time and the uh, time constraints and the time that it was made. But I think that with this type of story, there, there's a little bit more that they could have done. And I, I think that it was uh, a really interesting concept. But by the last act, I was kind of not really feeling it that much. Um, it, it essentially turns into a turns into a this is how we fix the situation kind of thing and it it wasn't really engaging for me but those first couple acts were really uh interesting to me and thought-provoking and that's what i like about science fiction so um i would recommend checking out the miraculous serum it's on youtube like i said um in its entirety and i thought that it was solid overall and uh i aside from some minor complaints it was it was pretty good and that'll do it for this week's episode of Anthology. Um, thank you guys so much for listening. And uh, next week, I'm going to be reviewing episode 33 of the Twilight Zone's first season, Mr. Beavis. And the bonus review for that is going to be uh, a science fiction, or uh, a sci-fi movie from 1957 called The 27th Day, directed by William Asher. Um, unfortunately that's not available on YouTube anywhere. I actually had to buy the DVD on Amazon. Um, I actually bought it in a, in a, uh, one of those DVDs that have six, it's a vintage science fiction movie DVD. That's a two disc, two disc set with six different movies on it. And one of them is the 27th day. It was only like eight bucks on Amazon. I'll put the link in the show notes if, if you're interested, but it, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to that next week. And also, um, we're coming up on the end of season one and I am really excited about it because this has been a really fun experience and I'm really excited to, to wrap up season one and do a season one wrap up episode. Um, to kind of put together all my thoughts on season one and I'm hoping to get Brandon Cruz from, uh, submitted for your approval on to kind of talk about season one, um, at the end of it. So having said that, that's going to be episode 31 or 32. I'm sorry. Episode 32 of the podcast. And what I want to do is I want to kind of get everyone who listens to kind of email in if you want and tell me what, how you feel about season one of the twilight zone. So what I'm, what I'm asking is if you, um, have favorite moments from season one, favorite endings, favorite overall episodes, and also least favorite moments, least favorite endings, and least fe- favorite episodes from season one of The Twilight Zone, go ahead and shoot me an email, uh, matt at obsessiveviewer.com. 
or send me a message on the Facebook page at facebook.com slash anthology pod. And I'll make sure to compile all those and put them in the uh, episode where we talk about or where I talk about season season one overall at the end of the season with Brandon from Submitted for Your Approval. So go ahead and do that. And uh, I look forward to, to getting your emails and everything and I'll put them in the I'll compile them into the episode. So having said all that, thank you guys so much for listening and uh, I'll see you guys next time. Thank you for listening to Anthology, presented by ObsessiveViewer.com. You can find more episodes at AnthologyPod.com, and you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or your preferred podcast app. If you'd like to help support the podcast, please take a few minutes to leave a rating and a review on iTunes. The more reviews I get, the higher the show will be ranked in iTunes search results, making it easier for people to discover it and grow the podcast. Of course, you can always email me your thoughts and feelings about the show to matt at obsessiveviewer.com. You can also tweet me at obsessiveviewer, like the Facebook page at facebook.com slash anthologypod, or you can call and leave me a voicemail at 317-762-6099 for a chance to have it played on the show. If you like what you've heard here, I urge you to check out The Obsessive Viewer, a weekly movie and TV podcast I host with my friends Mike and Tiny. Also check out the Obsessive Viewer blog at ObsessiveViewer.com where I write movie reviews, TV reviews, and the occasional editorial about the business of entertainment. If you want even more obsessive content in your life, subscribe to the Obsessive Viewer subreddit at r slash obsessive viewer and check out ObsessiveBookNerd.com, our sister site for book reviews, author spotlights, and a general celebration of reading. Finally, if you're philosophically curious check out my friend Tiny's side project podcast, The Secular Perspective, which explores the concepts of faith, religion, and existence from the perspective of secular hosts. You can find that at thesecularperspective.com. Once again, thank you very much for listening, and I'll see you next time.